Well, that was quite the wedding banquet. So there's an ox roast going on over there, and there's fatted calves being slaughtered and cooked over here. There doesn't seem to be a vegetarian option at this wedding, but that's maybe the least of our worries at the moment. For the host has taken umbrage because not enough guests have turned up. And he sent the boys out to sort it out. Not only that, but the guests have seized the big man's people and beaten them up and killed them. And so he sends in the heavies, destroys the murderers, and burns down the town. Now that's quite a wedding. Even for Glasgow, that's quite a wedding. <laughs> this little story has been around for 2,000 years, and my guess is that it's never been particularly easy to hear, read aloud, and certainly has never been terribly easy to preach on. And in the version of the story that Matthew offers us, Jesus just isn't prepared to let it rest. He just keeps on adding bits that make it all the more difficult. The king, the host of the wedding banquet, sends out additional invitations. Go out into the streets and invite everyone you see, he says. And the slaves go out and gather in everyone they can find, both the bad and the good. And there's lots of preachers have seized on that moment in the story as a moment of grace and inclusion. Everyone gets an invitation in the end. Hurrah! It must be about the inclusive, expansive love of God after all. But Jesus goes on. Someone turns up not wearing a wedding robe, and the big man sees him and isn't mightily impressed. How did you get in looking like that? And he looks to his enforcers and says, Bind him hand and foot. Put him out. And off he goes to be thrown into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, the sound of the gnashing of teeth is a terrible thing, and I suspect that Jesus could foresee or forehear the sound of thousands of preachers for thousands of years collectively gnashing their teeth at the prospect of interpreting this. For the inclusive, benevolent host never appears in this story, does he? So what are we to make of it, and how are we to think about it? Well, as I think about reading this parable this week, I'm reminded of a reaction that I once had to a well-known painting. I was down at an interview for something in Keble College in Oxford years and years ago, and I popped into the chapel there, which is very fine. Now, that chapel contains the painting called The Light of the World by William Holman Hunt, and lots of you will be familiar with it. You may be able to imagine it yourselves. For those who can't imagine it, Jesus stands there in the darkness, knocking on a door. And the door is behind a patch of briars and brambles, and Jesus is wearing a crown of thorns and wears a long silk robe and carries a lamp from which all the light shines. Now, I know that it's a painting which is an object of devotion to many people, probably one or two here, and there's still cues to see it when it is shown. But I remember looking at this spooky depiction of Jesus and instantly thinking, well, if Jesus comes knocking on my door in the middle of the night looking as weird and as creepy as that, then I'm never going to let him in. I would bolt the door from the inside. I'd look for ways to shut him out. You see, the way that we picture God matters. Really, really matters. Going back to the parable, I think that my problems start right at the beginning if we presume that the big man, the king, is the same as the God whom we worship. For I know for sure that I'm not much interested in a God who is involved in keeping slaves. I'm not much interested in a God who engages in violence. I'm not much interested in a God who provokes acts of terror and burns down whole towns in his anger. I'm not much interested in a God who compels people to come to the feast on the threat of violence if you don't turn up, I'm not interested in a God whom you have to dress up for, and I'm not interested in a God who consigns people to hell. I find myself in the face of such a God reaching for things to prop against the door, a bolt to fasten to keep him out. I'm not letting that image of God anywhere near my spiritual life. I'd rather set up a barricade against him. So how am I to read it today? What am I to make of it? What to do with this story? I spent nearly 15 years of my life 
trying to get access to weddings for those who were told that they were not welcome at the wedding banquet. And perhaps it's that which sharpens the way that I think about this little story today. As I mull it over, it just doesn't work for me to see the big man as the God that I know and worship. The God that I know does not behave like this. Instead, I find myself thinking of the ways in which religious communities try and get over the message to the people that they are trying to welcome to the Feast of Life week by week. The experience of preparing a banquet and then no one showing up is all too familiar in so many parts of the church these days. And the response of many Christians when no one shows up is very grumpy. We put on everything for you. They shout into the darkness and still no one comes and turns up. The people don't turn up to the feasts that religious people put on for good reasons, perfectly good reasons. Religion, including our religion, has been responsible for acts of terror and violence. Religious people have lashed out through the centuries at those who are different. And these days, they lash out at those who are indifferent as well. But God's mission in the world is a mission of love. But God always hasn't had terribly good representatives on earth to preach it. There are still plenty of people in this world who instead of understanding the news that God's love is expansive and generous and wonderful, have received the news either that they were never invited in the first place or that they wouldn't fit in if they did turn up. Going back to the parable and taking another look, I find myself reading the story of the man who turned up not wearing the right right robe as the story of someone engaged in an act of some defiance when either God or the church gets dressed up in the guise of a tyrant, none of us should be willing to wear his uniform. I'm reading the story of that man being thrown out in the darkness today as the story of someone who stood up to a tyrant, who stood up to someone who was violent and cruel. It's the story of someone who was thrown out for standing up to an oppressor. And I'm also reading it in the context of Jesus' other stories, which seem to paint a picture of a God who is always on the side of the victim, a God who weeps when the terrorist reaches for the gun, a God whose heart breaks when war crimes are undertaken, the God who is on the side of the oppressed, the God whose only response is to keep on loving those who need love most, the God who meets the despairing, whenever they are thrown out into the darkness. There is nowhere that we can go, nowhere that we can be thrown, where God is not present. Now, there are different ways of understanding the, this place of darkness and inclusion uh, and exclusion that's described in this Gospel reading. Some would imagine God consigning people to that place for all eternity, but there are other ways of imagining eternity that are open to us from Scripture. Maybe hell is of this earth and is of our own making. Certainly some will be living it today. But the God that I believe in wipes every tear from every eye, reconciles the seemingly unreconcilable, meets those who are cast into the darkness with love, and proclaims a kingdom of justice and of joy. The invitation to the feast from such a God is an invitation of love, not compulsion, not violence. Indeed, the invitation is love itself. Such a God is a God of peace and joy and compassion. For such a God, I will open the door. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.